Welcome, everyone. I'm Sharesty. I'm Violet. And I'm Emma. And we're Team Antipodes, an all-girls team from Pacifica. Um, we recently went to a international competition in Istanbul, Turkey, and competed there. And today we're going to be sharing with you some of our experiences there, as well as other tournaments, and also a little bit about our robot and other aspects of First Lego League competitions. So the first tournament we went to was in Santa Clara. There weren't very many people, um, but we still got first. So we then, from there went on to a qualifying tournament in Sacramento, which was a bit larger, and there we took third place, which qualified us to move on. And then we made it to the Northern California Championships, where we got third place again and we were able to move on to the Open European Championships. So they were scheduled in mid-April, but <laughs> the volcano erupted and covered Europe with a giant ash cloud, so it was postponed. Oh. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. It's called, um... I j Jaff Jala Jokel. <laughs> <laughs> So, just last week, on the 2nd and 3rd, we participated in the tournament in Istanbul with over 50 teams from all over the world. We did not place, but we still did very good. Okay, so you may be wondering how this got organized and such. So, um, FLL, First Cycle League, is the competition that we participated in, and it is it is one of four that is organized by FIRST. FIRST is an organization sponsored by Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway, and it stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. There are four programs organized through FIRST. The first one is Junior FLL. It's for ages six to nine-year-olds. It also uses Mindstorms Robot. Um, the one we were in, FIRST LEGO League, is for nine to 14-year-olds. Um, the next one is FIRST Tech Challenge. This um, uses a bit more complicated um, VEX robots, which are metal pieces that you put together. And that is for um, 14 to 18 year olds. And then there's first, robo first Robotics Challenge, which you basically make your own robot. And um, that is for also for 14 to 18 year olds. So on the course, the robot remains completely autonomous. And so if you touch it while the robot is outside of base, you get a 10 point deduction from the 400 total points you can gain from doing all your runs. There are 11 loops set up around the course like this. And if you bring, each one that you bring back to base is worth 10 points. So you can get a total of 110 points from getting the loops. But there's also a bonus involved. If you get three gray loops, you get one free red loop. It, and if you get all three red loops, you get one free loop of any color. So that means you don't have to physically bring all the loops back to base. You get some of them for free. If you release the car from the ramp, like right here, um, you get 20 points. If there are access markers in the corner, and if you knock each of them down, they're each worth 20 points, so you can get a total of 100 points. If you end on either the top of the bridge or the target area, you get 25 points. There's a crash test dummy that if he's kept in or on your robot the entire time, you get 15 points. If there, you have four passengers, and if they, if they end in the target, you get um, 10 extra points. There are also some obstacles. In the corner, there are four um, red walls, and if at the, end of your, at the end of your run they're all standing, you get 10 points for each wall, so a total of 40 points. And then there's also access or um, warning beacons that are set up all over. And if by the end of your run they're all standing, you get 10 points per beacon. So you can go to a total of 80 points. So each robot has one CPU, which is the brains and helps control everything that it does. Um, you're allowed to use one ultrasonic sensor, up to three motors, which have built in rotation sensors, up to two touch sensors and up to two light sensors. Along with this, you can use any other product that is built by LEGO. OK, so now that you know all the tasks that this robot has to accomplish and all the parts that are allowed in the robot, um, I want you to think of a robot that you would design that would reliably get 400 points every run 
in two minutes and 30 seconds, which is the time limit for FLL. So close your eyes. I want everyone to close their eyes. And I want you to imagine for 30 seconds what you would make. OK. So <laughs> not exactly 30 seconds. So I want, so as I know, as probably all of your ideas are very different from each other, similarly, all of the um, FLL teams have very different robots. So here's one of them. And as you can see, they all have different attachments, different strategies, and they're completely different. So here's our robot. No, no, no. there's our robot. So um, one thing unique about this robot is that it's very simple in its attachments. We want to spend as little time and space as possible and more time out on the course completing the tasks. So we have a touch sensor with a plate so that we don't have to actually touch the sensor. We have two light sensors, uh, rear guide wheels so we can run along the wall, the CPU, a frame on the bottom to hold it together and to block extra light, a front touch sensor, two drive motors, two drive wheels, two front wheels, another set of guide wheels, a arm and axle, for, I mean a motor and axle for our arm, sides, a front frame, a support for the motor, a roof, and a sensor activation plate, and an arm. And this is it together and blown up. So after you've done designing the, pro the robot, it's time to program it. There are, we use a programming language called Mindstorms NXTG, which is an icon-based programming language that is, a, is much easier for younger users to learn. And there are simple blocks, such as the move or motor block, shown here, that will just make the robot go, go straight, churn, or something like that. But there's also more complicated arrangements of blocks, such as the line follow program, shown here, um, in which you, they, you use a lot more complicated blocks. And so once you get into more complex programming, you can use loops, which the line follow is contained in, if-then switches. And you can also use um, your programming to orient yourself around the course. So for instance, you can back into a wall. And if when, it when the touch sensor is um, touched or pressed, it will, it will stop the robot. And so that way, you know exactly where you are on the course in relation to the rest, to everything else. And our robot does that a lot of times. And so now we're, we can show you just what it does. So we're going to run our ro robot for you now. Usually before we do runs, we do a light calibration because we, during the line follow program, we do um, a line follow, or we do, we use the light sensors. And if the lighting conditions will change, and so if we just had one light value for, the, for all of them, it, might mess up, and so we have a shroud on the bottom as well as doing a light calibration in which it reads the value of white and the value of black, and our line follow program finds the average of those two and stays on the gray. So it stays right where the black meets the white instead of only on the white or the black.
So since now that we got all three gray loops, um, we can get the red loop. And since we got all three red loops now, we can get the blue loop right here. <laughs> so sometimes our robot can be a bit unpredictable, like that instance right there. Um, it, sometimes the sensors are a little bit off, so it'll run into something and it'll have a collision like that. So now in our real competition, or so now in our real competition, the referees would come over and they'd review everything with us, and we'd, we'd get t um, get told how many points we got. So first we start with the loops. We got 10 out of 11 loops, so that's 100 points. We got the car, so that's 20. We got all four access markers, so that's another 100. So we're up to, what, 220? And then we actually did not land in the target, and, but we did have Buster, so that's 15. So that's 235. We didn't knock, any, knock over any access markers, so that's 315. We um, also didn't knock over any walls. So that's 355, and but we didn't land in the target, and we didn't land with the people in. I said that. And so that is our run. So this whole experience of um, of doing FLL, the FLL season, has been an adventure and quite a learning experience, actually. We now know more about how the engineering process works, how to make our ideas become reality, and how to work as a team. It has also helped us decide what careers we want to pursue in the future. Um, if you know any uh, anyone, adults or kids, that are interested in FLL, please let us know, because it's such a great experience. And there's a lot of kids out there who would love to be a team, but they just don't have a coach to get them started. Um, so now we invite you to come up closer. We can run again. Um, if you have any questions, we can answer them, and you can take a closer look at our robot. Yes? Can you elaborate on your career plan? <laughs> <laughs> I um, personally want to be a robotics engineer. Um, I would love to work for NASA one day, um, build satellites and rovers and such. You want to? I want to be a vet. <laughs> um, and... In doing this, you have to present a lot and teach what you've learned to a lot of people as we're doing now. And through this experience, I've learned that I definitely want to become a teacher. Any other questions? Yes? <laughs> um, one of the big challenges of building it is that um, we chose to go under the bridge here instead of, um, let's see if I can go over here. You can go under here and cross over these. And it's a, we decided to go under here, so our robot had to be a certain height. And also over here in the corner, if she wants to point. Um, it, there, there's a very small space we can turn in, so our robot can only be that wide. So our robot is as big as it could be to do the um, task as we have. And also programming line follow was difficult. <laughs> so the line follow we did was called a PID line follow program, which is proportional, integral, and differential. And um, so basically what it did was at the beginning, as I, as I said, it, we have two light sensors. And one of them would read, the light sensors detect how much light is reflected back off of the mat when it shines a light on it. And so they're assigned numbers. And so, for instance, white would be 50 and black would be 100, except for it would probably be black is 50 and white is 100. And so what it would do is one light sensor would read 100 and one would read 50. And so instead of staying only on the white and only on the black, it would stay one light sensor would be on the black and one would be on the white. And so really it would be staying right in the middle. So it would, be, it would find the average and stay right in the middle the whole time. But um, as you saw, it's not... It's easier to say than to write the program for, and it's a very long program, and it's it's 
most of it is math and calculating. We had a lot of variables that we had to make, which are um, set numbers that are repeated throughout the program. And it's all calculating, calculating, calculating. And at the very end, there are about three move blocks. And so it just repeats that over and over and over again to do the line follow. That took me about th two to three weeks to write. Any other questions? Yeah? Or Well, there was, I, I was basically the only builder, but they definitely had input. I think um, the main differences we had was in the strategy, which definitely influenced how the building of the robot went. And also, in building the arm, um, one of the things about an arm is it stays parallel to the ground the whole time due to the um, state. There's a um, stable gear, and the other gears rotate around it. At some point, we wanted, a few of us wanted to just have an, arm that stuck out and just went like that, and others won the parallel. So there's definitely disagreement in that. Any? Yes? Or? You mentioned, of course, in a very nice, simple way that, well, you've designed your robot, and then you wrote the code on your ADL sound. You just kind of have it like that. But I'm, I'm curious as to what the design uh, process uh, and its interaction with the programming process, how, how does that work? Usually these things kind of iterate around. Yeah. Well, it's, we kind of, we had to get the basic build of the robot, and then we started programming, but then at the same time, we would be building more and changing things, so then we would have to change the programming. And it, it's a little bit difficult, especially for the programmers. Well, I mean, it's difficult for the builders too, but the programmers will write a program that they like, and it's all working, and then the robot will be different, and they have to rewrite it some other way, and. So it's a little bit it's a little bit difficult to just keep going through that, but in the end it works. <laughs> but both of us, <laughs> um, it, we had a lot of time constraints as a team. She was doing theater, I was in marching band, and Emma was on um, track. And so we all had after school activities, and it was really hard to meet as a team. And so most of the time, what we would do is we would meet as a team on one day, and we would decide as many strategy decisions as we could make. And then we would, the program, we would program, and then the designers would meet, uh, the designer would meet, and, <laughs> and she would design. And, um, cause what would happen if we were all together is that she would be trying to build the robot, and we would be trying to write the program, and you can't do both at the same time. We would be fighting for custody of the robot. <laughs> so, we ended up working, um, we would work together on the important strategy decisions, but then we would separate and um, work independently for the building and developing. Yeah? yeah. Um, can you talk about the, the layout of the course? When is that decided? Is it the same um, when you know it has a time that's So you, there's a main theme for it. It changes every year. That is released like May. Um, so we found out, well, yeah. The theme is released in May, and then the course and the mission and the mat and everything is um, released in September, and they'll mail out everything to you. And usually the first real robotics meeting you have is putting together all these pieces on the mat. They just send you the pieces and the instructions, and you have to put everything together. And then once you have it all set up, you can really start strategizing. So that's all in September. And then the first competition is in November, so you don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> Yes, I think. <laughs> um, I, one of the things we didn't realize you can do, um, for this blue loop here, we didn't want to get it because it has beacons all around it. But um, what something the other teams decided is that, oh, you can bring the be beacons back to base and stand them up in your base, and you won't lose the points. We didn't think of that until we saw someone else do it. We're like, oh my goodness, that would have been great. And we went, we've had so much trouble with that orange loop back there that it would have been a lot simpler. I think that's something I personally would change. Yeah. Yeah? The weirdest thing that happened. Uh, how did you figure out what time to get home? Yeah. Um, 
we had our last competition the first day, our robot can't run straight. We're just like, what is happening? And actually, um, two things were sort of going on. One, one, the motors was completely breaking down. And another is that um, we have these plastic wheels on the bottom. There are front wheels, I guess they are. And um, they were rubbing against this other plastic piece. And so they were making these grooves. And we didn't realize this till later. And so they, there was these giant plastic grooves that we would, did not expect at all. And it was completely affecting the straightness of the robot. That was something unexpected. Also, one time, I put the slide on backwards. And we realized that it actually works better, so <laughs> we just changed it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Do you want to talk? Um, we have a coach, Ken Pilar. Um, <laughs> we, you're allowed, you can have many coaches and you can have mentors, which are generally um, kids older than yourself who help you with strategizing and everything. And um, the purpose of coaches is not necessarily to like, they, they kind of help you along and if you get stuck, they can give you suggestions, but they, they try to not interfere with like your, with you building it. It's supposed to be the kids, not the mentors. And also we, um, along with this in the competition, there's also a um, project part where you, um, you have to build, uh, pick a, something. This year it was about transportation. So you picked something in your community that you wanted to change about the transportation. And in that you could get a lot of like outside help to, for research and whatnot. It, they actually encourage you to. Yeah? yeah? Um, well, this is actually my first year doing this competition, but I've always love robotics like um i just robots have always i've always wanted to build something like that and yeah. so this is me and shirsty's second year and the year before we were on a big team that was just kind of randomly put together we got dead last at the first competition <laughs> i think our high score was 40 points um and our low score was like 20 which was uh, pathetic um and so we definitely, me and Shirsty learned a lot. Um, the first thing we did was we decided we wanted a much smaller team with people who actually were going to work and care. So it became us. <laughs> One thing we learned from the previous year is that um, the previous year we had spent all our time in base and putting on different attachments and changing little things that really took a lot of time out of the mission and. Uh, is part of what caused us to only get 40 points. And so that definitely helped us this year. It was one of the first things we decided was that we were going to spend as little time in base as we could. And we practiced over and over changing out the, uh, doing our base time to make sure we got it to as little base time as we could because we didn't want the same thing that happened last year to happen this year. Was there a question? Um, it didn't change that much. Actually, um, we have a shroud on the bottom that we built because um, at one of our competitions, our line follow just didn't work. And it was because there's these big skylights at the top and the light level would change during our run after we did our calibration. So that's one of the major things that changed. Um, I think basically everything else stayed the same. A lot of programming differences. We, yeah. Um, Getting the orange loop in the corner, we went through many, many uh, trial and errors in trying to get that. There was, but we ended up going back to the same thing that we had at the first competition. So <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of uh, difference, but there was a lot of progression and learning and trying to get that to work. And also from the first competition, at the first competition, we didn't have, in running it, we didn't have a high score of 400. We had a high score of about 370 because we didn't get the gray loop on there, which means that we didn't get three other loops, and um, or two other loops. And so throughout that, we've gradually gotten in, um, we've gotten more and more points also as the thing went on. You didn't even try to get that. Yeah. Yeah. Or we didn't we didn't try to get that at all. We just left it out and hoped to get 370.
Yes. At the first competition, um, it was in Santa Clara, so we just drove there. And there were about like 16 teams maybe, which is a lot fewer. At the second, there were maybe 37 about. And at the, at the NorCal tournament, there were about 48. And then at Istanbul, there were about 52, I think, from all over the world. And to get to Istanbul, we had to do a lot of um, fundraising from local businesses and more corporate businesses to get the money for the plane tickets and hotel and everything. But due to the volcano, um, a lot more expenses came up, so we're still trying to fundraise. We, we're still short. Um, we, we built a website to um, help get funding, so we have a website and you can go to and just like $10 helps. <laughs> Always a good fundraising opportunity. We've gotten 400 multiple times, yeah. We didn't get any at the Istanbul tournament, um, but at the NorCal tournament, we got one 400, and we've gotten 400s in practice um, many times. Our robot is unpredictable. You never know when it's going to be a 400, and you never know when it's going to be like a 300. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah? Um, <laughs> Me and Emma, well actually me and Emma in the fall, we're going down to Tasmania because we have a sister team actually down in Tasmania and they invited us down. So we're going to do FLL down there since it extends to 16 in all the other countries except the U.S. And then after that, I think um, we're going to do FTC. And we decided FRC was, you need like a 20 person team and we're not going to be able to recruit that many people. <laughs> yeah. So, any... Any other questions? Okay, um, you can come take a closer look at our robot, see how it works. We can probably run it again if you would like. So, yeah, come on. So off to the side is our um, research project, which you can take a look at, which is maglevs. We have working maglevs. <laughs> Someone working maglevs. Thank you.